got it. And then uh, switch on the camera. Yeah, all right. Yes, all right. Thank you, one minute. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tony, for inviting me. And uh, uh, so thanks for everyone for joining uh, on Zoom. And uh, we're going to, uh, and also for those who watch the recording later, uh, you know, they'll be happy to answer questions and, uh, if you have questions. So the, uh, let us know, Tony will be monitoring the, uh, the Zoom so that if you cannot hear something or you get, uh, or the, if the video, uh, if the uh, projection is not quite right, let us know. Okay, so the, I'm going to be talking about uh, a, uh, a project called BAM, a uh, big accelerated memory. And uh, it's a system architecture and software stack for accelerating uh, compute directed sparse access to massive data sets. And I'll explain why this is important, and uh, what are the things that we, uh, the approaches that we currently have in accessing these uh, uh, massive data sets and uh, how BAM changes the game and uh, how well it does, okay? So, There is a conventional wisdom. And um, I think most of us who have been working on systems know that uh, we always teach students in our operating system classes, computer uh, architecture classes, that uh, the latency for accessing um, storage devices is so long that uh, uh, you know, we really need to uh, you know, the access, uh, the, to need to access the storage in very big chunks. And uh, when we say huge chunks or very big chunks, we, we mean uh, at least 512K bytes uh, in, uh, in our systems. And oftentimes uh, people will set their system uh, threshold to uh, more than a megabyte uh, in, in accessing storage. So every time you go to uh, access storage, you should access a big chunk of data so that uh, you can amortize the latency and um, uh, you know, the overhead uh, for uh, for those accesses, so those come the conventional wisdom led to the what we call the memory storage divide, and um, uh, in in this picture we show that uh, there are really two worlds. One is the storage system, that's where the data resides, and uh, and all the data will need to go to the other side of the system, which is the memory and processor. The memory and processor on the other side will have operate on data structures and code. And so that the, uh, every time if we need to, uh, to uh, put in, uh, access any data in the storage, we need to load data from the storage into the memory before the processor can address individual elements and then treat it as data structure and uh, operate. So the, uh, I'll go through, uh, you know, the implications of this in uh, today's systems, and also the, you know, the the kind of attempts that people have been trying to uh, to use to uh, be able to break this divide in the uh, in the past, and why the uh, the approaches don't work, and uh, then I'll uh, talk about how the uh, the, the BAM system uh, address this divide and uh, break up the separation. So. Before we talk about the system, I'd like to talk about uh, you know, the applications, right? That we always need to uh, know what the, uh, a new innovation or new uh, system is designed for. And um, uh, the kind of applications that we're, uh, we're, we're looking at are what we call the trending applications, but uh, uh, things like uh, data analytics where um, you know, the even uh, you know, average sort of a tip, uh, common um, uh, Analysts these days need to access very very big data sets, 
and use some of the characteristics that they found in the records to, uh, to access more information uh, from uh, the uh, other records and so on. So, the, so the, you know, the, um, the analytics have evolved into these you know, the lightweight uh, transactions that uh, require us to be able to pick uh, selected data according to the characteristic of some other data in the, uh, in the same data frame or database. So the, these accesses in, uh, tend to be sparse, compute directed, uh, and uh, uh, access into uh, very, very large uh, data tables and so on. So that's the data analytics. And uh, these uh, tab tables tend to be uh, somewhere between, let's say, uh, you know, the 10 gigabytes all the way to maybe one petabyte even uh, for uh, you know, in industrial scale applications. Another uh, important class of application is uh, what we call the uh, graph analytics and graph uh, you know, the, uh, neural networks. So the, uh, the graphs are usually uh, fairly big in industry. And uh, uh, if we look at uh, Amazon and we look at Facebook and so on, they tend to have fairly big graphs in terms of nodes and edges. But the, what really makes these things very, very big is what we call the node embedding uh, features and uh, edge features. These are the, uh, the, the, the properties of, let's say, uh, individual users, products, and so on, uh, that, the, uh, that these companies use to describe the uh, users and products. And uh, these, the information are needed for making recommendations and then for making you know, the, uh, you know, the advertisement decisions and so on. And the, these are the kind of uh, you know, the node features and, uh, and edge features tend to be the, the, the biggest part of these uh, graph databases. And uh, these uh, you know, the features tend to be you know, somewhere between uh, you know, range between 10 gigabytes and uh, hundreds of terabytes today. So the, and these are the kind of applications where uh, we tend to access very large data sets in a compute directed, somewhat uh, random looking uh, accesses. So the, uh, before we go into the, uh, the, uh, the BAM system, uh, I should also set the context for uh, how the memory and storage speeds and feeds look like today. And, uh, uh, oh, I should say Gen 5 here rather than Gen 4. We updated uh, the slide for Gen 5 for Hopper. So the, uh, the, the picture shows that uh, uh, we have the CPU, uh, which has the root complex. And then uh, you know, the, the CPU also has the host memory uh, available uh, to the other devices through root complex. And then uh, we have the uh, PC, typical T PCIe switch. And sometimes the PCIe switch is just part of the root complex. In reality, the root complex is uh, you know, the, a, a PCIe switch. And um, so the, we, we will have uh, SSDs, solid state uh, drives, uh, that are connected to these uh, PCI switches through uh, typically by four uh, connections. These are narrow PCIe uh, you know, the connections from the storage into the PCIe switches. And then we'll have data stored in the, store, uh, in the PCIe, uh, in the uh, SSDs. And uh, some of the data, uh, the connections may actually go through NIC. That is, uh, we can also have SSDs in the storage servers, and uh, they will be accessed through the PCIe into the NIC, and then the NIC will transmit the data to uh, another NIC in the local, uh, in the client system into the, uh, into the uh, TPU memory or host memory through what we call the RDMA, remote uh, uh, direct memory access. So the, on the uh, other side of the picture, I show the GPU with its memory. And then here I show the uh, H100 uh, GPU with a PCIe Gen 5 connection into the uh, PCIe switch. So the, uh, the important uh, numbers that, uh, to remember is that uh, uh, for GPU to access its own memory or HBM these days, for Hopper, we have about three terabytes per second memory bandwidth. Whereas uh, the PCIe connection is much lower, it uh, uh, will have only 64 gigabyte per second uh, connection. So, so that, that's, the, uh, that's one of the challenges and they should be Gen 5 rather than Gen 4. 
if we look around the industry, um, the conventional wisdom is beginning to, uh, to, to, to become less and less uh, valid. So there is a very important trend that we cannot ignore. That is the capacity and cost of fast storage uh, devices or SSDs that we just talked about have improved uh, dramatically in the past decade. So when the SSDs first came uh, into the picture, uh, the SSDs tend to be very uh, limited in size. And uh, remember, we used to have these, you know, the 512 megabyte uh, uh, little, uh, as, you know, little uh, USB drives, right? Those are from uh, with SSDs. And then, uh, you know, we have the apples and the uh, laptops that use SSDs for its uh, uh, its its uh, storage. But those are the, uh, you know, the, those tend to be only uh, up to maybe a small number of terabytes or even just hundreds of gigabytes. But uh, you know, after a decade, uh, now we're seeing SSDs that are three, six, or even 12 terabytes. And these are the kind of uh, improvements in capacity and so on that allow the SSDs to begin to really replace the traditional hard drives in data centers, in serious, serious uh, data center environments. So now we're seeing per pervasive usage of SSDs, both in the local, um, you know, server nodes, and as well as the uh, data, um, you know, storage nodes, and these are the kind of things that uh, that will change that that, uh, that change how we view storage in the data centers. In the past, when we think about storage, we tend to think about uh, hard drives, and uh, where uh, the access latency is uh, fairly low, and also the uh, latency is very high, and um, if the, uh, whenever we do the access, the throughput is determined by how fast the disk is spinning. Whereas uh, in today's devices, when we start to uh, look at mostly SSD accesses in the, uh, in, in the data center for a lot of the data that we use, then uh, you know, we start to look at much, much lower latency and uh, uh, much faster throughput uh, from uh, these SSDs for the storage. So the, in reality, because of this change, the, uh, the latency and throughput of the, uh, of the CPU operating system service it, for accessing the storage, not the storage devices themselves, the controllers, but the, the operating system services, and the, uh, actually had been uh, the determining factor uh, you know, the, uh, for the uh, access because the throughput and the latency of these services have improved only modestly um, you know, at best in the past decade. So uh, you know, the, we're, uh, we're beginning to see that uh, the CPUs are having a really hard time keeping up with the demand of the GPUs, for example, in serving uh, you know, the, the IO uh, requirements and data accesses for the applications that we care about. Uh, you know, uh, uh, at the beginning that we described in the beginning of the talk. So um, let's go into the technical details and uh, talk about uh, how we should reason about uh, processing massive data sets. So the, we have, a, let's say we have a massive data set in the SSDs on the, uh, on the right. Okay. And then we have one or more GPUs on the left where the, each GPU has certain amount of uh, memory, or even some of these could be CPUs, certain amount of memory. So the, uh, you know, so the, that's the memory with the uh, GPUs. So the way to think about this is that, um, uh, let's say uh, we can decide whether we want to preload the entire data set into the collective memory of all these devices. In the special case, if you only have one device, you preload the memory uh, data into that device if it fits, right? If, if the data set fits into that memory. The question about whether we should preload the entire data set and then do the access versus trying to do the access piecewise during runtime in, uh, from the storage without preloading the whole data set is determined by a fairly simple 
uh, uh, simple in equation. So the, the left side of the in equation is the, uh, the, the access is uh, basically the access of the, uh, the initial load, which is one, uh, which is the initial the load cost plus all the accesses U. U is the, all the data accesses into this data structure or data set uh, divided by the collective access latency of the memory. So basically the, the total cost is that you preload it once, it takes some amount of time. And then once you preload it, you're accessing the data through the memory uh, bandwidth. So the, you, you, you add, you take the total number of accesses the application needs to make, which is U divided by the memory bandwidth, right? So you get a approximate, uh, you know, the indication of the total amount of time used for accessing data this way. Whereas if you just access the data directly from the storage with then you have all the accesses U divided by the bandwidth of the interconnect, which is PCIe, which is T here. So the, if the uh, if the uh, the uh, the left hand side is much much smaller than the right hand side, then you should preload. Okay, from performance perspective, you should preload. And um, so, uh, given the fact that the uh, uh, the memory bandwidth is typically much, much higher than the PCIe bandwidth. We would expect that people will always want to do preload for performance, uh, you know, for performance. However, what is different in these applications is that you can actually be much lower than one because we're doing sparse access into the data structure. Uh, the intuition is that uh, when you do some kind of search, or you, you do some kind of data analytics, oftentimes the data that each, uh, you know, each inference or each um, you know, query that you're doing only need to access a very small portion of the data anyway, right? So, so, uh, so the, that's why you know, every time you do a uh, inference or do some kind of a uh, certain uh, you know, intelligence, you should be uh, accessing the data in a very sparse way. That's why you can be much, much slow, uh, smaller than one. And if you got, got, uh, take, uh, take that relationship into the equation, you will realize that the left-hand side is actually much greater than the right -hand side. And this is the fundamental, uh, one of the fundamental reasons why uh, the current frameworks of using GPUs uh, for handling uh, massive data sets work reasonably well for training but uh, does, uh, they do not work uh, reasonably well for inference. This is one of the main reasons for that inefficiency because we uh, typically need to uh, preload all that data into the GPU memory. In some cases, uh, even today, we just begin to use the host uh, memory also for that purpose, but still we need to preload the data, right? Yeah. Uh, the U is number of U's. Uh, yeah, so the question is, uh, you know, what is the, uh, the unit for U? Remember, U is just the number of accesses. So the unique dynamic accesses into the data structure. So uh, let's say if you have a uh, you know, the floating point uh, uh, data, uh, double precision data, then uh, you know, the, uh, each element you access counts as one, okay? And then if you add the characters, then each access is, you know, the, uh, uh, actually counts as uh, uh, 64 for double precision because uh, the, uh, the, uh, the unit for uh, A and T are in terms of bytes, right? So we're all operating based on bytes. So the number of dynamic bytes access divided by the number. Okay. So um, for a lot of these uh, traditional, uh, what we call the uh, large data set applications, such as, you know, things like, uh, um, you know, the uh, linear, uh, solving huge linear systems or training uh, large language models and so on. And the, uh, the, the data set used in some of those, uh, in those applications that are preloaded into the GPU memory or pool of GPU memory tend to be the model weights and biases and so on, because those model weights and biases during the training process 
will be updated and re read and updated multiple times each. So the U is very, very big. And it's always better to preload them into the memory and operate. Whereas in inference, it becomes a very different story because even in some of the models and weights, not to mention some of the embedding data and so on, tend to be only accessed sparsely in the inference. So that's why preloading doesn't uh, really pay off. So our applications typically will have you much less than one. And in, uh, again, the unit is the bytes accessed. And uh, so uh, that's why the trade-off is not clear. So the, and, uh, by the end of the talk, the trade-off should be um, very clear. So the current approach for processing uh, you know, the massive data sets is you know, the, uh, pretty much uh, what we call the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, kind of the pre proactive uh, preloading and the uh, uh, memory pooling. So this, here's an example. Uh, uh, I'm going to use this kind of uh, you know, the graph quite a bit. So the, uh, the, uh, the x-axis is the time. Okay, so the, uh, we, uh, we go from, let's say, beginning of the application to the end of the application in the x-axis. Hey, Rosa. So the, yeah, so now, now we just double the, the, the physical audience. We have most of the audience. Okay. And then uh, uh, the, the y-axis is the uh, address uh, uh, space. So basically, uh, it could be the, the uh, linear address for the data I, uh, elements or the uh, index space uh, for the uh, big array or tables or uh, key for the key value store. So the, uh, here we show uh, kind of the, the time progression of data access pattern uh, through the, uh, let's say the address space. And um, uh, here I show a very predictable file dense access pattern. So the, if your application can be organized to do, you know, let's say very, very heavy access unit one, and uh, all the accesses can be localized into a, a small portion of the data uh, address space. And then uh, you go to two, you, uh, you, you, you can, you know, the, the, all the accesses are focused on uh, in that part, and three and four, then, the following, uh, then it becomes uh, very, very easy to deal with in the current uh, software stack. So what we do is we will use the, uh, what we call the CPU proactive piling and the host code in the CPU will just read in a, 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 a big uh, patch of data. So in this case, the one, two, three, four, five in the previous uh, picture. And then uh, you, know, you can even break it down into smaller portions and send them into the GPU or just send uh, maybe one of the, uh, those big portions into the GPU depending on the, uh, the, the, uh, the application. And then the GPU will just crunch on it for a while. So this actually has been the, uh, the primary uh, usage pattern for a lot of the GPU applications. So that's why uh, we tend to uh, support uh, the uh, matrix multiplication type of application Tensor type of application uh, because these access patterns can be predicted and they can be tiled, focused in each time. Uh, each time. So um, you know this works well for the uh, you know, for, for for the current. And uh, in this case, the software stack needs to partition the data and uh, uh, compute and orchestrate the data movement, and uh, while the GPU crunches, so you can pipe and things and then just keep the GPU falling and so on. It works reasonably well. However, this incurs uh, you know, the high I.O. Uh, you know, the amplification uh, in the case of uh, sparse access. If the accesses are sparse, then sending these big chunks into the GPU and only access a small portion of it will be a losing proposition, right? Uh, so this can be a real problem that as we will show in us in some of the applications, but they may not apply to the applications where the threads, uh, you know, the uh, need to uh, to see the entire data set in order to be able to uh, to address uh, the from uh, address the data set. So uh, the the patches may be too big to fit into the GPU, and then you start to have trouble. The the 
the real trouble begins when the, uh, the compute directed uh, uh, access pattern is really spread out into the address space and uh, things like this. The time goes to the right and the address goes in the uh, or vertically. And then you see that at each time you have, you know, that your accesses are uh, you know, in, in the, a relatively small uh, touch of the data. And this is exactly the access pattern that we see in a very large scale data analytics and uh, graph analytics and graph neural network uh, you know, feature uh, accesses. So how do we deal with that today? Um, the, the, in, at NVIDIA, uh, what we uh, recommend our, uh, our uh, customers to do for, the, uh, for these large data sets is through memory pooling. So a, a collection of GPUs into a what we call the MB link domain. Okay. And uh, so these GPUs can, uh, are connected with each other in a much higher bandwidth. So in the, uh, in the hopper generation, uh, we have almost uh, one terabyte of uh, uh, X, uh, the, uh, hundreds, uh, several, almost one terabyte of uh, uh, bandwidth between the, uh, each pair of GPUs in the MVLink domain. And uh, then uh, we uh, preload the data set into the uh, MVLink domain and, uh, and shard them into the GPUs. And then we use things like nickel and so on to, you know, to allow the GPUs to access each other's uh, data. This approach, um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, has you know, uh, uh, two important limitations. Uh, one is <laughs> this may require thousands of GPUs uh, to be able to, you know, the, uh, to hold uh, the whole data set. And um, this is one of the reasons why uh, we, are uh, we have continued pressure to increase our NVLink domain. So the, uh, if you uh, look at the, uh, the, the one of the big changes from the uh, computer generation to the hopper generation, uh, the, the size of the uh, NVLink domain, that is the way that we connect uh, NVLinks, you know, uh, use uh, the uh, GPUs with NVLink switches, uh, grew from uh, 64 GPUs to 256 And uh, one of the reasons is that uh, more and more our customers are using bigger memory pools to be able to, to, to hold bigger data sets for this kind of access. And, um, and keep in mind that uh, you, unless you, uh, you connect them to high bandwidth interconnects, even accessing each other's memory, you know, that can be very, very slow, right? But if you need to go through the, the NICs, you know, the, uh, the bandwidth is much lower. The bandwidth becomes the PCIe bandwidth, essentially. essentially. So that's why you know, the, we were building these you know, the very large but still, when people try to host you know, some of these very large data sets uh, you know, uh, in the GPU memory, they can be using even tens of thousands of GPUs. And um, so the data exchange in reality, when you access data from each other's memory, is much lower than the HBM bandwidth, right? So that is that deteriorates. The, uh, that deteriorates the, the real access speed. And uh, so the, and uh, one of the, uh, also the, a very, very uh, fundamental problem with this approach is that it incurs high preloading overhead. So in order for us to be able to support, let's say inference based on this kind of data set, we would uh, need, need to spend sometimes days of preloading into the GPU and then do a you know, millisecond inference <laughs> based on the data set. So that's not a uh, you know, very, I would say, for many of the new applications, especially when the inference become uh, popular and uh, uh, the heavily used applications for GPUs in the future. So, uh, so one of the things uh, that we, uh, we, uh, we did in NPR generation uh, to, uh, to be able to situation is uh, allow the GPUs to access memory using what we call the pinned uh, zero copy access. So the, uh, the previous generations of um, uh, unified virtual memory allows the GPU to logically access the host memory. However, uh, the, the, the granularity is actually quite big because of 
when the GPU access a piece of data that's in the whole, uh, in the CPU memory, it triggers a page fault uh, in the GPU. And then the a page fault handler will uh, DMA the data into the GPU, and then uh, it will continue. So the, but if you're accessing a piece of data that is you know, the, not a, uh, a page size, and also that if you're accessing a large number of these things, the page fault handler cannot keep up with the, uh, with the uh, GPU requirements. So that's why in the anterior generation, we just allow the GPU uh, memory uh, system to directly access the host memory as long as the memory is pinned. And uh, so you can uh, uh, do the address translation, figure out that the data is in the CPU, and, uh, uh, and use the, uh, uh, the PCIe path to uh, a memory map uh, uh, access into the CPU memory. And the CPU will deliver the data through the memory map into the GPU. And that takes the page fault handling overhead out of the picture. So, so this allows us to be able to have a much bigger um, you know, the uh, chunk of data in each host memory for the GPUs. And then uh, the, the, the GPU can just access the data uh, you know, the, through the, from the host memory. And this uh, reduces the total number of GPUs that we need in order to just to host the data, uh, to, to be able to contain the data set. The trouble with this particular approach is that uh, you know, even the host memory is still limited. So the, for example, most of the uh, servers in the data center uh, you know, have, you know, I would say one to two terabytes of memory in them. So the, uh, for the, uh, let's say if we need to host a, uh, you know, the, um, a multi, uh, you know, 100 terabyte of uh, data, we still need to have, you know, something like 50 hosts. So the, and also each host will have a typical so if you take the host memory and divide it up uh, by the, uh, the uh, the GPUs, then the, the host memory is not that huge anyway. So the, the, in reality, the amount of data that you can really place into the host memory for this purpose is quite limited because the host memory is already used up by many other things when they serve the GPUs to begin with, okay? So the, 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 the reality of this approach is not as great as uh, you know, people would uh, like to uh, would imagine. So the, and, uh, uh, and uh, all processes in this case still need to go through PCIe switch. And uh, uh, so this is another reason why um, the Grace Hopper super chip can have some advantage because in the Grace Hopper arrangement, the access to the host memory goes through the PC, uh, the, to the MV link rather than the PCIe. And that will give you about 10 times uh, more bandwidth when you access the host memory uh, from each GPU. Um, and um, uh, it, you know, it, it still uh, you know, this requires you to preload the data into the uh, CPU memory. So the, you know, the same problem uh, with the uh, uh, GPU pooling still exists in this particular approach. So now, uh, if we don't want to preload data, right? Uh, we, we keep telling you that we don't want to preload, uh, spend hours or days to preload data uh, GPU or CPU memory. It is on demand access uh, to the storage. Right. As the GPUs perform computation, then you know every time you need a new piece of data that's not in the GPU memory, you go and <laughs> get it from the storage. Right. So that's on demand. And um, currently, uh, the only approach to do this is through page fault handling. So we're back into the unified virtual address space kind of approach, where the GPU access a piece of data, you do the address translation. And um, uh, the G GPU thinks that it, it, uh, it, its virtual space is big enough to, to, uh, to cover the entire data set. And um, you map the data set into the uh, virtual address space through uh, memory mapping, so memory map file, right? And, uh, and then you, you know, the, when the GPU access data that's not in the memory, the virtual memory will say, oh, I don't have the data. And then uh, it goes to the CPU and the CPU says, oh, I don't have the data either. 
And then I uh, use the memory map. Access the data to the PDU. And this goes back to my original comment. Uh, the page fault handling mechanism and um, uh, all, all the uh, you know, uh, and all the interrupts and all the uh, you know the uh, services and so on involved in that page fault handling mechanism is extremely slow compared to what we can do on this GPUs uh, today. So that's why um, you know there's not enough throughput. The overhead limits the the, the performance of this kind of approach, and um, uh, it uh, uh, often is that uh, you know, uh, even the GPUs in uh, intake bandwidth cannot even be fully utilized because of the host GPU software overhead. And uh, I also need to admit that, uh, uh, the, remember I talk about the virtual memory address translation on the GPU, because the GPU also need to initially generate the, the page faults and let the CPU know that there's their page faults. And that mechanism is also not quite fast enough for you know serving the kind of epic, uh, the, uh, speed that we have in the GPU. So um, the, this led to the development of the BAM. And um, uh, so uh, we started this project about six years ago at the university. And um, uh, the initial the, you know, the project was a collaboration from the university and uh, IBM. So the, uh, the first use case for BAM was actually IBM's, uh, 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 IBM's use case in uh, uh, checkpointing of uh, uh, you know, GPU state in long running, uh, you know, the uh, long running uh, summit applications. Yes. Okay. okay. So the, I should stay kind of close to. See. Okay. Can you hear me better? This is good. Good, good, good. Okay. Uh, so let me know that if it still doesn't work well. So the uh, uh, so in uh, when we created the BAM uh, you know, the uh, BAM system, uh, we started with the application client view. So we we started by asking what the applications will likely want to see if we have a very efficient mechanism for the application to access a uh, massive data set that is uh, backed by a storage. And um, uh, but some of the, the data will be cached inside the GPU memory and perhaps even the CPU memory, but the, the bulk of the data will be uh, you know, backed in the storage. So this is the application uh, view of the uh, BAM system. So we're running an application on the GPU, okay? And the first thing that we, what we provided is a, uh, is a capability for the GPUs to directly ac uh, access data on the storage. So the, this can be in the form of, uh, let's say NVMe driver. So we, we, write, uh, we wrote a user level NVMe driver and um, uh, the NVMe driver can uh, uh, communicate with the, uh, the SSD controllers. And um, uh, so the, you know, we can uh, request blocks directly from the NVMe uh, drivers. So this is the simplest form of a, uh, of, of a, uh, a BAM system. In the more sophisticated deployment, especially in the data centers and the cloud, then uh, this, uh, you know, th these queues are going to be communicating with a storage server. Uh, you know, the, that would uh, through the network and the storage server on the other side will be uh, you know, uh, providing the real NVMe driver and so on. And uh, in those cases, we actually can use uh, the BAM, uh, use the GPUs as the uh, storage service uh, on the service as well to speed up the access into the NVMe devices. As I mentioned, the CPUs have not been able to, uh, to uh, access the NVMe devices at the speed that uh, the GPUs demand. So, so that's the, uh, the low level, uh, you know, the IO queues and the uh, drivers. Now, uh, uh, above that, we have a uh, GPU 
a memory cache or uh, what we call the uh, uh, BAM application cache. And this cache is configured for each application. And the, uh, the cache is actually the mechanism for allocating buffers and coalescing accesses uh, by thousands and thousands of GPU threads into more manageable batches. In, uh, and uh, before we actually do the uh, I.O. request. So the cache is really a uh, mechanism to figure out, um, one, if some of the uh, accesses of the, made by thousands of threads are already in the local buffer, right? If it's already in the local buffer, you have data reuse, great. Then uh, you can just serve it. But in many cases, because the GPU memory is so small, um, you need to go to the storage. So it also to figure out whether thousands of these uh, threads are actually accessing a, you know, let's say a, a fairly small chunk of uh, data. So let's say each thread is trying to access eight bytes of a data structure, but a warp or a, 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 a block may be accessing a, you know, altogether a 4K chunk, right, uh, of data. So this is oftentimes the case for like a, a graph applications when you access a, you know, the, let's say different uh, parts of a, a node feature and the node feature total is a 4K feature, but you have different fields in that you know, fields in the, uh, in, uh, you know, in the feature vector and these different uh, threads may be accessing different fields of the feature vector. So now you coalesce them together and access a 4K byte chunk rather than each of them sending a four byte access into the storage, right? And then uh, you can also have a situation where um, you know, some of the uh, access are actually exactly on the same data. Uh, you know, so you want to be able to, you know, to, to have only one of them access the storage and the others can just uh, get the data. So that's the, uh, the application cache. Obviously this cache will impose some overhead, right? Because instead of accessing the HPM directly for that data element, you need to now use a API to access a cache. And all these threads need to access metadata in the cache and determine if they should if their accesses should be coalesced, if, if the access can be reused and all that, uh, all those overhead. So uh, you, we need to build that cache in such a way that it cannot be too too much slower than if you just access the data directly from the HPM. If it's a hundred times slower, then nobody will use it, right? Now, if you access a piece of data, uh, you know, even if it's in a cache, it's a hundred times slower. But uh, if it's ten times slower, maybe. If it's five times slower, likely that people you use it. If it's one third, people will most likely use it. Right. So these are the kind of things that we need to, um, you know, the engineeringly, we need to uh, do the right things. And then uh, in the user level, we provide a uh, fam familiar array like or key value store like uh, 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 interface. And uh, so that the uh, people think that they're just accessing array elements and so on in their uh, application. But then, uh, you know, uh, with C++ templates and so on, uh, we, we, if we actually uh, call a, a device function in the back for cache access, right? And then eventually deliver the data. So with them, the GPU uh, threads effectively are accessing, you know, the, the opaqueness of the data structure in the storage goes away, right? The, uh, the, the BAM, the system opens up the storage and allow the, uh, the, the GPU applications to be able to directly index into the storage and so on, treating the storage data as a big array, right? Or a key value store kind of things. So, so that takes away the opaqueness of the uh, storage and remove the divide. So the, 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 uh, from research point of view, uh, you know, uh, we have you know, we need to to, to do uh, quite a few uh, you know, research projects in order to be able to build this uh, you know, the BAM system uh, properly. Uh, one is the uh, application cache. So the uh, the traditional way of building uh, you know, the hardware cache is that uh, you have a controller, 
right, than a, a cache controller. And hopefully the cache controller uh, has enough throughput to serve all the CPU core, you know, cores and threads and so on, or the GPU for the threads. But um, uh, the trouble with that is that um, uh, you 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 uh, you need to you, you need to uh, potentially build many many controllers and so on. That um, uh, you know, and we currently you know the uh, it, it will be likely going to be you know something that we'll look into in the future. But in the current generations, you know, we need to uh, we need to have a way to uh, to be able to serve uh, the cache uh, in high throughput without many, many, many controllers to, uh, to give you that throughput uh, in the existing hardware. So what we did was that we used a self-service model. Okay, so we have the cache directory and, uh, uh, and metadata also in the HBM. And then uh, we, you know, that we have every thread to go and look up the, uh, the, uh, the metadata themselves. And whenever there's a miss, we also uh, use these threads to do self-service and uh, place the request into the uh, the uh, the uh, the IOQs. So this is a self-service model. So as long as we can you know, handle the uh, the coordination across threads and synchronization across threads fast enough, this is a scalable model. Because the more requests we have, the more service you know the threads that are also running the services, right? And uh, uh, so it's all about how we can uh, you know, do the atomic operations and, um, and any locks that we need to use in order to change the, uh, the cache state whenever we have misses and so on. Uh, uh, we need to be able to, you know, to, to have high enough throughput of all the metadata data structure. And that was the research that we had to do uh, you know, for, the, for uh, quite, a, uh, uh, you know, quite a, uh, a few years. And uh, so eventually we built a very high throughput cache uh, with these you know, the capabilities and uh, we're able to achieve for hit, uh, you know, we can achieve about one third of the data access throughput compared to accessing the HBM directly. And uh, so this brings us uh, into the, uh, the realm where the, the application developers and the uh, uh, Consider this to be extremely attractive, right? Because you know, you you can ac uh, access the data in about one third of the bandwidth, but then uh, you can access much much bigger uh, data than you can ever imagine. Now, um, so it, uh, it there was a previous uh, research. This is just to demonstrate that uh, you know how uh, the, the, how how hard this problem is. Uh, uh, several years ago, uh, there was a, a, a S plus paper published by uh, you know, the uh, Silver Silverstein uh, about active pointers and uh, uh, using the uh, page fault uh, handling mechanism. But there is a, also a software cache in the GPU. The red shows the uh, the, the uh, effective bandwidth uh, running on uh, Ampere uh, using the active pointer cache. And uh, with all the, uh, the research that we had to do, uh, the blue line is the, uh, the throughput of the cache uh, on Ampere using a uh, band. So the, uh, we're, you know, we're talking about the, uh, more than order of magnitude uh, improvement of the uh, throughput because of all the, uh, you know, the, the uh, innovations in terms of the, uh, the atomic operation, what we call the sec logs. And uh, and also the uh, you know, the the use of uh, the warps and uh, in, uh, the independent scheduling features and so on to be able to get to the level of uh, you know, the throughput. And uh, uh, so the, there's the IOQ which has very similar things, but there is a, a very important uh, you know, innovation that we had to make. Uh, the traditional way of uh, us using uh, IOQs in the CPU. Is that every core will have a uh, uh, will have a queue, and then uh, so the uh, whenever the, the core needs to enter the data, uh, it will uh, enter the data into its own queue to avoid atomic operations and locking. Okay, but the trouble is that uh, uh, when we have so many threads in the GPU, we can no longer just provide one queue per thread, and uh, we have to uh, begin to use you know, these uh, atomic operations and. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, in coordination across threads. So uh, we 
uh, we also needed to uh, to make sure that uh, to, to take advantage of the huge number of simultaneous accesses uh, so that uh, we can do what we call the dynamic batching. So the, uh, we basically the, you know, look at all the, all the uh, threads requests and then put together a batch request uh, into the storage service. And that batch request will have a fairly large number of requests together. And we only need to enter this whole batch into the queue once so that we don't need to increment the, the, queue, uh, the queue pointer sequentially. And more importantly, when we clean up the queue, we can just clean up the whole batch rather than decrease, uh, increasing the, the tail pointer uh, uh, of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the head pointer of the queue you know, sequentially. And that drastically increased the, uh, the throughput of these IO queues. So if, uh, if you look at the, the IO queue submission, there's also orders of magnitude uh, faster than the previous uh, work. So the, uh, if we look at the BAM, uh, you know, the threads uh, at, uh, as a, uh, uh, in, in terms of the application GPU thread, um, the C GPU thread will access a piece of data in, uh, that uh, is uh, you know, uh, in the data set. And that data uh, access uh, invokes a, uh, a, a, uh, a device function to, uh, to, uh, uh, to access the, uh, the application cache and the uh, metadata. So it calculates the offset into the data structure and uh, it does the warp level coalescing. And then uh, it, uh, it uh, does a cache lookup. If, the, if there's a hit, that means that uh, someone else already got the ca uh, data into the cache, then uh, you can just return the value. But uh, if it's a miss, then uh, you enter the data into the, uh, the IOs, uh, uh, into the, uh, the, the, the IO uh, the queues and then you submit the command uh, to, uh, through the submission queue. And then uh, the service would uh, do this. And then uh, keep in mind that all this is already, already auto-batched. And then uh, eventually the service will come back. So the, uh, the requesting thread will be polling for the, uh, the data. And then uh, uh, when the data comes back, you would uh, uh, update the, uh, the cache state and then uh, you the, uh, clean up the, uh, the the completion queue and the submission queue, and then uh, it would uh, return the value into the uh, uh, into the application. So the question is, can BAM tolerate storage latency? And uh, this uh, is a, one of the very fundamental uh, design uh, that we uh, that we need to pay attention to. That is, um, these SSDs have millisecond level latent, uh, uh, microsecond latency, and uh, sometimes even into the low milliseconds. So uh, whereas the, uh, the HPM in the uh, GPUs have somewhere around the 50 nanosecond latency, okay? So we're talking about the three orders of magnitude difference in terms of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the latency that we need to tolerate. And uh, the, uh, whether or not we can tolerate the latency is uh, determined eventually by, uh, if we have a bunch of accesses, can we fully utilize the, throughput of the PCIe. Because if we fully tolerate the latency, then at any point in time, we will be having good transfers uh, through the PCIe. In that case, we, we're doing the best anyone can do, right? Uh, if, if we can access data by fully saturating the in, uh, PCIe intake, then you know, we're, we're good. So the, I, I'm showing a, uh, a simple calculation using Little's law. And the Little law says, if you have a latency and then uh, you want to have certain throughput, then uh, if you multiply these two together, um, you would uh, have the needed acute depth. And what we're showing here is the applications that use spam have enough threads that want to access the data. It would, it would generate enough requests at any point in time to have long enough queue depth. Okay, low enough queue depth or enough accesses in the batch that will allow us to fully tolerate the SSD latency and fully utilize the bandwidth. And uh, currently in Gen 4, it means that at any point in time, we need to have at least 500 pending accesses, pending accesses in order to fully saturate the Gen 4. 
for Gen 5, it will be even more. It will be around 1,000. Okay? And it's not a problem for the kind of applications that we're working with. So this shows you the software architecture. And then uh, uh, this shows you how the, uh, you know, the, the GDX kind of systems uh, are currently organized, but I want to make one important point. The point is that each GPU has a uh, by 16 intake in the PCIe. So that determines how fast we can pull data from the storage into the GPU today. However, uh, I remember I mentioned the, uh, the NVLink domain. So the, with MV links and the G, and DGX systems, we can actually uh, exceed that limitation. That is, um, the GPUs can also rely on other GPUs in the same MV link domain to access SSDs through other GPUs. And then the data can be DMA directly into the requesting GPU through MV link. So, uh, so this is actually uh, one important uh, feature that uh, we, uh, the band is going to have in order to be able to exceed the intake bandwidth of each GPU, okay? So what kind of performance are we getting? So that we have been you know, the evaluating uh, band with, uh, uh, you know, the, with, with these uh, PCIe platforms. And uh, uh, this particular platform was from H3 platform. And, uh, it's, uh, you know, the, and uh, this platform is uh, sold as super micro platform and uh, uh, you know, the HPE platform and so on uh, in the OEM market. So the, uh, we, what we, uh, we have is that uh, we connected a large number of SSDs uh, into, the, uh, into the platform. And then we have a, a A100 GPU to be able to access uh, uh, all these SSDs because remember, even though we can submit the request very fast and we can have batch them very fast, but if the SS, there's not enough SSD controllers, they cannot keep up with the GPU requests, right? So we, we need also need to have a large number of these controllers to be able to, you know, the, to match the, the service uh, demands from the GPUs. So the main point of the, uh, of the, of the experiment is one, yes, the controllers are fast enough and we can put together enough controllers on the storage side. So controllers are no longer the bottleneck, okay? And two, we remove the CPU service services from the, from, from the access, right? We use the GPUs to, to, to do the direct request. So we remove the software overhead and the bottlenecks from the, the, the CPU software overhead and so on from the access. And we prove that with this setup, we can access the data fast enough into the GPUs. So the, uh, here is the experiment of scaling the SSDs to up to 10 SSDs with 4K byte accesses into these SSDs. And um, we also show that the, if you go down to 512 bytes in accessing SSDs, you know, the, how we can also uh, you know, the saturate. We can go up to 50, almost 50 million IOPS uh, into uh, in this particular uh, box uh, with 10 SSDs. And uh, by the way, uh, this is the rate that uh, uh, most of the data centers have never seen you know, in, uh, in data accesses into the storage uh, from a single GPU. They, they, they were, uh, the closest number that we saw in the data centers was about uh, 2 million IHOPs. <laughs> okay, so so this is the order of magnitude that uh, we're talking about in terms of the uh, improvements. Okay, so the, we're almost out of time, so uh, I'm going to go uh, skip a couple of the things and then I'll tell you, give you one interesting uh, piece of data. Uh, so these are the, just characterizing, you know, the how bad the CPU software stack really is you know, in terms of the overhead and so on. So the, but uh, you know, the, uh, we don't quite have time to, uh, to go through all that. So just let me just show you uh, one of the, uh, you know, the GNN results that we, we collaborated with Amazon to, you know, the, to get some data. Uh, this is about GNN uh, training, graph neural net training. And uh, during the training, uh, we have these uh, node embeddings. And uh, for, uh, for what we call the uh, industrial strength, uh, you know, the graphs, uh, these uh, graphs tend to be you know, the, uh, at least 10 terabytes in terms of the feature vector. So it's very, very hard uh, to access the data uh, you know, the, uh, through, uh, 
to, to pulling GPU memory. So the current approach is uh, that uh, uh, people use for DGL and, and training the neural network when the uh, embedding data does not fit into the memory is by using memory map files. Okay, so exactly what I described, the GPU will access a piece of embedding and then you will realize that it, it, it's a page fault. It, it notifies the CPU and the CPU will look at its own your know, pages and say, oh, I have a page fault. So then it goes to the storage to access the storage and, that, uh, and bring the page into the, uh, into the CPU and then CPU would uh, uh, refresh the page in the GPU and, and you, you continue. And so that's the current approach they have uh, you know, the, with DG, DGL today if, if the data doesn't fit into the, G, uh, into the memory pool. But then uh, using uh, BAM, uh, they were able to, you know, to, to use the BAM software stack and directly access the, uh, the storage for the feature vectors. Here is the, uh, the interesting uh, result. So the, for small graphs, you know, the, the, C, the CPU can just cache, you know, basically uh, for small enough graphs, the CPU can just cache everything in the page cache. So if we warm up the cache enough in the CPU, then uh, we, we, uh, the, the benefit is only a few times faster. But as soon as the, uh, the, uh, the graph truly exceeds the page cache in the CPU, then uh, we're talking about hundreds of times of speed up in the training. We're talking about training, okay? And we're getting you know, the several hundred times speed up in terms of compared to the memory map approach. So the, uh, it speeds up the end-to-end -end training by more than 380 times. And uh, uh, when we aggregate the features, you know, the aggregation phase of the features for the uh, DGL, we're speeding up more than 600 times. Okay, so summary. Um, you know, we built a uh, application uh, stack, you know, the uh, le uh, user level uh, software stack for the GPU applications to be able to access these massive data sets that can only fit into the storage. And uh, we can, you know, the, uh, for some of these applications, you know, that we are looking at, you know, that we're, uh, we're looking at, you know, multiple times of improvement in terms of the, uh, you know, the, uh, what we call the IO amplification. And then we have, you know, a uh, large improvement in terms of the effective memory capacity for these applications. But then uh, we have the end-to-end -end performance improvement from uh, make, uh, six, seven times all the way up to about 400 times. So that's the summary. But uh, I also wanted to, 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 uh, to, to, to show you that uh, these kind of results are not produced uh, in a few months. This whole thing started in uh, 2015 and then uh, you know, the, we, we went through multiple generations of collaboration with uh, IBM and NVIDIA, built uh, several generations of software stacks and so on, and eventually published the paper in 2023 as plus. So the, uh, this can be a disaster for a PhD student because you know, the, it, it takes so many years right, for this to happen. But when you have this kind of paper, it will become a classic in the future. right? So the meaning of this is that uh, we are beginning to see an era where the traditional operating system services are beginning to be democratized. We're beginning to, to have more and more of these services in the user space in the app, uh, and uh, being part of the application because that's the only way we can scale these services. That's the only way that we can satisfy the application needs for throughput and so on uh, in these systems. And the work opens up a huge number of research directions and so on. And uh, you know, the, you know, basically, you know, the, well, we, uh, we need to look at uh, you know, future uh, you know, more accelerators for data access and movement. And uh, well, we're going to uh, look at how we can optimize and specialize caching for applications and how do we even add some uh, hardware support in future GPUs to be able to do the cache lookup and so on even faster? And uh, we need to uh, you know, in, in, uh, leverage emerging internets such as uh, CXL and so on in industry, and, uh, which is more efficient than the PCIe. We need to improve the IO protocols for parallelism. We already have a research project on uh, what we call the uh, buffer pool protocol to replace the Q-based protocols. 
and we have multiple GPU, multiple node support, uh, then, uh, then suddenly we have cache coherence and uh, memory consistency at the huge uh, scale. And then uh, we have GPU architecture uh, improvements for let's say uh, scheduling and so on to further to help tolerate latency. We have a uh, file system and cloud infrastructure support to, to allow the user level services to operate in these environments and security and isolation support uh, when we use the user level uh, services. So the vision is that we want to have the programmers to be able to just code, uh, you know, the, the code uh, op, uh, operating on the data, and then uh, you know, something like BAM will figure out where the data is and how to deliver the data the best into these applications. Okay, so the you know, the uh, we are not the, the only ones, and uh, you know if you look at Intel, uh, Intel is you know working really hard in the HPC world for exactly the same reason. So even the CPUs are having trouble you know, the, uh, being served by the traditional operating system services. So the, so the, uh, the DIOS project is, uh, you know, the use, uh, is migrating a lot of the services into the user space for exactly the same reason. You know, they want to be able to have the, uh, more of the GPU threads running in the user mode to be able to serve these applications faster than the traditional uh, kernels that are uh, being you know, that are being slowed down by a lot of the kernel level locks and so on, and the uh, serialization in the kernel mode. So um, many many people uh, participated involved uh, in uh, you know, uh, in the research. So the, you know here are the uh, all the uh, you know, hardware uh, you know the uh, people who help us with hardware, firmware, operating system frameworks, you know, the machine learning frameworks and so on. So uh, you know, need to thank everyone. And uh, you know, I really hope that uh, in the future, uh, we will have even more collaboration. So that's why I'm giving these kind of talks. And hopefully, you know, the, my friends at UPC will begin to, you know, to have some collaboration as well in the future. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's uh, so the uh, the question is uh, when you have a miss, what happens? Uh, you know, uh, what really happens to the data? Right, uh, because we submitted the request through the submission queue and eventually the service will be done. So the, um, uh, let's take the local uh, uh, SSD as an example. So the local SSDs will have the uh, controller on the same PCIe domain, that's a requirement. The, uh, the NVMe device has to be in the same PCIe tree as the uh, GPU. So the, uh, we, we currently have what we call the GPU direct async support that maps all the controller, um, the controller control registers into the uh, GPU address space. And it also enables the controller to write directly into the GPU memory through PCIe as an IO uh, mapped memory access. So the DMA transfer will be directly from the uh, NVMe controller into the, uh, into the GPU memory. It does not go through the host memory. And the, uh, for network devices, there's something called SNAP uh, in, our, uh, in the NVIDIA the network switches. So the, we extend what we did there and the, allow the remote uh, NVMe controllers to also do RDMA directly into the GPU memory. So, so in, in any of these cases, they all go straight to the GPU memory. That also means that currently it doesn't work for Ethernet in general, <laughs> because Ethernet does not have fully generated support for RDMA. And uh, that's something that uh, Mellanox is working on. So the, it will probably take one or two generations for general Ethernet switches to, to, to enable it. <laughs> These things all take time. <laughs> I 
I, I cannot comment on it. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk in private. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, okay, so the, what Tony is asking is that, um, you know, that with all these experiments, right? The, the, so, uh, you know, how much DRAM do we really recommend for each of these GPUs or uh, you know accelerators? Um, so, you know, at our from our experiment, uh, of course, it it depends on the working set, right? That uh, you you allocate uh, to to these things. So uh, we, uh, we don't have a full experiment yet, but we did some initial experiment. Uh, the initial experiment is that uh, when we do GNN training, and um, uh, if we have multiple GPUs, we can do some graph partitioning and then uh, you know, the, in, the, in work assignment, and then let it cache just to suck in the data that's needed by each GPU according to the work assignment right, from that graph partition. So the, what we found out in general is that uh, uh, once you have eight gigabytes of cache capacity, it's quite, quite good so far. So the, because the working set is very different from you know, the uh, kind of taking in the entire graph partition right first and then pick out the, uh, the ones that you need. So with a cache, you know, we typically have about one to 10 or even sometimes one to 30 ratio of working set versus you know, taking in a whole chunk. And that's what I was talking about in terms of the IO amplification, right? So, so I would say we recommend at least a gigabyte of cache capacity. And uh, that also probably would uh, need about one gigabyte of metadata. Nickel, so uh, yeah, uh, uh, there, uh, there are libraries like Nickel and AAC, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, 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 Andy Lake, exactly, Andy? yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, okay. yes. And uh, also, uh, uh, the uh, NVIDIA also enabled uh, unified address space across uh, your GPUs in the same NV link. So we can do atomic operations um, with the, across GPUs. So that's why when you have multiple GPUs and you have multiple caches, if you want to combine these caches into a, a, into a single cache so that the people, the GPUs can access other cache if it doesn't have the data in the local cache, right? The atomic operation actually works. Whereas in PCIe, it doesn't work. PCIe just doesn't support the atomic operations across the PCIe at all. Okay, okay thanks again. <laughs> <laughs>